Live from Seattle, Washington, it's theCUBE on the ground. Covering KubeCon 2016. Brought to you by the Linux Foundation and Red Hat. Here's your host, John Furrier. Hello everyone, welcome to theCUBE on the ground here in Seattle for KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Kubernetes Conference. I'm John Furrier, you're watching theCUBE on the ground. Our next guest is Chris Wright, Vice President, Chief Technologist, Office of Technology at Red Hat. Uh, thanks for joining me today. You bet. So you had a keynote up there, uh, OpenShift is uh, Enterprise Kubernetes Ready, um, really talking about the momentum that certainly OpenShift as a past layer, platform as a service has been around for a while, leading one. I think you guys have the biggest contribution, I think, on OpenStack if I last checked. Um, but it's been around for a while, it's been iterating. But Kubernetes really talks about this next wave of dealing with the interest from application developers That's right. on how to move quickly to write software to drive new applications and business value. That's right. So you can orchestrate it, but yet there's still a lot of stuff that needs to go on under the covers. Um, what does it mean? What does this Kubernetes enterprise ready mean? And is it truly ready in the enterprise? Well, uh, from our point of view, our customer base is an enterprise customer base. So making something accessible to the enterprise is a huge part of what we're doing. Um, Kubernetes is a new technology. So anytime you have a new technology, there's going to be you know, the standard road bumps of just polishing, making sure it's uh, accessible, usable, and then helping the enterprise really uh, take advantage of net new technology uh, without abandoning the investment that they have from the last two decades into their entire IT infrastructure and applications that they're that they're already supporting that actually run their business. You make a good point about you know you guys have been a, you guys are are a tier one provider of open source. It wasn't the case when you first started. Open source wasn't tier two, so to say. But now it's clearly you have SLAs that are what seventeen years or something. It's ridiculous amount of support. But this event and the you know the cube likes to go to these events. We see that are going to be game changing. We see containers and Kubernetes as a game changer, accelerating the cloud native architecture for cloud apps. Clearly, and you know we do our best to get here. So I, this will be big. So you have kind of this industry changeover, this new community developing here, where there's a lot of rah rah in the hall. Always. Yeah. Okay. Now, but your customers, they don't want rah rah. They want rah rah and it works. So stability. S yeah. Stability. Talk about that because this is where the transitions um, fail on, on new technologies where everyone's cheerleading it uh, to hell and high water and then they go cross over and then they don't get it That's right. to the next chasm, yeah. crossing land properly. Your thoughts, are you, this is what you guys think about, your thoughts. Well, we're always paying attention to the hype cycle, so we want to make sure we're, we're investing in real technology. So it's not just enthusiasm, boundless enthusiasm, without being grounded in some real technical and, and maybe more importantly, uh, community uh, reality, where people are actually collaborating and building good technology. Kubernetes, from a technology point of view, is, a, is an awesome way to manage applications at scale across a distributed set of, of infrastructure, a data center or a cloud. Mm -hmm. and um, our customers are looking for the ability to operate at that scale. They're looking for the platform independence or the low level platform independence so that when you build your application, you can move it to your virtualization infrastructure, your private cloud, multiple public cloud providers without having to fundamentally change your process and your, your development methodologies just because how do you see the how do you see platform. the adoption of containers and kubernetes in the enterprise over the next year or so and what are some of the drivers and some of the inhibitors that customers see well the adoption rate is accelerating so what we see is uh, actually earlier this summer there was a, a good bit of data from an analyst showing uh, adoption rates for containers were sort of teen percentage in production in in the enterprise which doesn't sound huge, but what was important to note was the trajectory, so it was doubled over the year before. Yeah. And so it's really in this high uh, acceleration period. The challenges are, now we just did a study on this, and we, and we found that the challenges were concerns about performance, concerns about scalability, con concerns about stability, concerns about um, orchestration and integration. So it's really kind of all the basic things you need in your IT group. Those are top concerns for the CIOs and IT leaders, and what that means is it's a new technology. There's a lot of uh, uncertainty about how to deploy it into your uh, into your IT group, and wanting to be sure that the investment required to bring that into your organization brings value. It's not just 
we, we built some really cool new thing, but we could actually uh, realize real value, business value. You know, I always see the, you know, the companies over the years market, going back to when I was breaking into the business, even just in the past uh, seven years with the Cube, a lot of marketing campaigns, be the superhero of your organization, you can be the, this is the IT narrative, right? Yeah. And, but reality now is, is that with DevOps and with this cloud native concept, the developers are truly now actually leading the charge and are, have to become more business minded. So is this DevOps a bridge between the IT business? Because you know developers are more and more, it's not all of them, but a good chunk of them have to deal, deal with business conversations like OpEx, CapEx, value, how do right. I, you know, kind of like an MBA if you but none of them really want to get an MBA, but right. they have to kind of get savvy and be faster. I think part of what you see to enable that is bring together different parts of the organization so that a line of business owner, a product manager, is sitting directly with a set of developers who are sitting directly with um, the kind of QE teams and the operations teams. So, the, you know, kind of the, the microservices model, the small pizza team says you can develop rapidly if you have narrow focus and a cross-functional team. And so I think it's not necessarily the individual developers needing to have all the insights into the business as much as having direct lines of communication and really sitting together yeah. to build applications that meet the business needs. I call it the developer MBA without going to school for an MBA, this <laughs> organizational behavior, formation yeah. issues, you mentioned the pizza team, uh, communications, and also linguistic uh, <laughs> relevance around words. <laughs> I gotta know what stuff means. So that brings up a whole nother discussion. So the, the container story with that enables those developers. So at a high level, where's Red Hat fit in here? Because up the stack, the value is very clear. New things are being invented, new processes are being automated, so I can see the containers really enabling that. But going down the stack, there's still a lot of stuff under the covers, like DNS and security. That's right. That people are concerned about. That's right, so the, the survey that we looked at, security was at the top of the list, and so we think of it in terms of, first and foremost, for us, the foundation is going to be Linux, and it's Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and that's uh, something that we feel very confident about. Our customers are deploying that in mission critical areas uh, of their infrastructure, and, and we understand the security story there. But it goes beyond that, so you're building applications, you need to make sure that as you build the application, you're, you're leveraging uh, secure content, signed content, you understand when and where um, the code came from, the image that you're, that you're pulling from some registry, where did that come from, what's the code provenance, what's the update model when you find vulnerability uh, in, that, in that image, uh, what's the security policy around connecting the different components of your, of your application together. So there's a lot of uh, important questions and there's, that, that's where a lot of the work is happening today um, in, in communities like Kubernetes, including enabling onboarding of more traditional applications or stateful applications. So you don't necessarily have to build your cloud native app 100% stateless and when you get to where you're storing your data in the database, you're back in some bare metal system that doesn't have the automate, uh, you know, the uh, automation around it to improve your You know, Red Hat has such a great developer traction over the years. I mean, with Linux, you know, you've seen, again, my generation was, you know, kind of first generation, what I call first generation, not probably not exactly first year, but first generation where open source really became a viable option, mm -hmm. certainly as a rebel, but then as it goes tier one, and you guys have done that, you've, you've had great success with communities, certainly in the enterprise. Now, Amazon Web Services has a unique go-to-market in 10 years ago, and they targeted the, the full-stack developer concept. Right. That became the cloud. That obviously is what it is today. Now, with hybrid cloud, there's an enterprise developer category that's evolving and changing. Yeah. How does the container uh, story from Red Hat change its your appeal to developers? Has it changed their interest, their orientation, their their excitement? Can you share your thoughts to the developers that have either worked with Red Hat in the past or haven't? And well, how containers can make their life great? And how does that appeal to them? And what's in it for them? Yeah. Well, I think the the cool thing for us is this kind of container movement and container orchestration platforms is the first time in the in the industry where really different layers in the stack come together. So we're appealing to the operations teams as well as the developer teams uh, because we're providing a platform that allows a developer to move quickly. So you grab an image, you just add your code and its direct dependencies as part of the application. That code may, in an enterprise environment, may be written in Java. We have a rich set of uh, middleware tools that many of our enterprise customers are already deploying and we're doing a lot of work to ensure that those same uh, tools and services are part of the OpenShift platform. So it's sort of a seamless experience moving from a traditional environment to this cloud native environment. In, in addition, we're trying to ensure that uh, the actual uh, 
application server itself can be small footprint, fits well in a container, uh, works well in the kind of microservices model, and focusing on all of the, the messaging and interconnection between the different uh, components in the ways that we have historically for a long time. And SOA to microservices is not such a leap of, of faith. It's really just an evolution of the same concepts. You guys have a great ask the kind of the kind of cultural question. In a way, you're kind of an incumbent. <laughs> You've been around for a while, been successful, but also you're an innovator because it's a software world now. Right. So you, so there must be internal conversations within Red Hat that be like, we have to disrupt ourselves. We have to constantly be innovating because that's the big critique right now from customers. I have existing relationships with the Oracles and the IBMs and, and there's known things that are inside the enterprise that aren't going to go away. You know, you guys are one of them. At the same time, there's pressure to innovate. That's right. Well, Your I, thoughts on Red Hat's innovation and what it means to developers. I, first of all, I do internally when I'm speaking, <laughs> I use the phrase disrupt yourself or be disrupted. So it is very much about a mindset, being open to try new ideas, being open to the learnings that come with failed experiments. Um, but That's a um, culture at Red Hat. That's a culture at Red Hat and it's important to keep innovation alive. Um, the other thing that we stress is we don't need to be the authoritative source of all innovation on the planet. In fact, we never will be. We're just, we're just not capable of that. We can add to communities, we can come up with our own new ideas, but a big part of what we do is work in the communities to identify the emerging trends and the emerging communities that really are the disruptive technologies and then sort of tame that and stabilize that and bring that to our enterprise customers. So it's being at the forefront of technology, identifying where innovation is happening, where we're appropriate, where we're capable, we'll we'll throw in our. You guys have you guys always say you don't tout your horn enough, in my opinion, and that's probably from the community of folk approach, where right. communities fail when there's always smart the smartest guy in the room trying to own it all. It's it's really a collective body of work, open source. We, and we do have a sort of a, a humble style, and that is actions speak louder than words. Um, you know, we really are focused on not just a bunch of, of loud marketing, but real practical Well, you guys results. also have great SLAs. You have 10 plus years, 17 years on, on some of the rail stuff, but obviously you have the community, you have the track record, performance, right. and then the innovation. And by the way, being humble is not a bad thing. Look at AWS, Andy Jassy, is, is probably one of the most humble guys in the world, and you know, he just nose to the grindstone. Look at them, they're, they're lapping the field on the public cloud. Yeah, they're doing a great job. So, congrats, good formula. Chris, thanks for sharing your thoughts. Final comment on this show, Kubernetes Con or KubeCon and Cloud Native Con, what's the hallway conversations? Could you summarize the vibe here for the folks watching? It's just raw enthusiasm. A lot of exciting uh, work is going on here. A, a ton of really talented developers building an amazing platform and I think people really recognize that. So it's just raw enthusiasm, a lot of excitement. Awesome, Chris Wright, Vice President, Chief Technologist at Red Hat. This is theCUBE on the ground here. Not live, but we're recording in the room. We do whatever it takes to get the stories. This will be a big community. This will be a big conference. Again, on the ground floor, bringing it to you. I'm John Furrier on the ground here in Seattle. Thanks for watching. Oh, <laughs>